Hello, I'm Rob Hirschfeld, CEO and co-founder of RackN, and this is the March 25th Cloud 2030 discussions where we talk about open source ecosystems, uh, or at least we start there, and we get all the way through to what is going to make uh, us have ecosystems and marketplaces. Uh, it really is an operative theme. There is a significant amount, amount trigger warning of OpenStack uh, bashing and discussion in this and Kubernetes uh, discussion too. So if you're interested in those uh, ecosystems and why they are working or not working, um, because they're both doing some of both, then this will be an entertaining conversation in the middle part. Enjoy. Last yeah. week, I was, um, I tried to join a clubhouse a chat about infrastructure that was being organized by the uh, Andreessen uh, Horowitz folks. Did anyone see that it's being promoted on Twitter? Why would Andreessen do something about hardware when he's software is eating the world? <laughs> he's oh, never going to live that oh, down. It wasn't Andreessen per se. It was um, other folks. Um, Martin, I remember. I remember seeing it. Now, open flow person, um, core DNS person. Yeah, people. I that remember seeing it announced, it. but but I didn't. I didn't have the opportunity to join. Was it any good, Lawrence? It was okay. It evolved into go to market talk, talk yes, their VCs. Um, <laughs> so I jumped. I can't handle, and you know, what if I can't talk? No one's let me interact. Why do I want to be part of 500 people listening to that? But it's relevant to our conversations. That's why I brought it up. <laughs> uh, and it's relevant because they were basically talking about the fact that they're, that they're thinking that there's a move away from open source in, in the cloud infrastructure in terms of the infrastructure in general that everything's running on, that people are more and more using proprietary hardware and software to run their infrastructure. And that's what they're seeing as a large secular trend. And that jives with some things we've been talking about. Yeah, no, I mean, I've seen anecdotal, of course we've talked about it, but yeah, I've seen that anecdotal evidence. I, it, it's anecdotal and I didn't, I don't 100% agree with it. I think it's somewhat, it's just a not dead cat bounce back change. But of course, <laughs> when I said basically in the data world and operating systems and certain things, it changed so dramatically from proprietary to open source that of course there's going to be a move back somewhat in the other direction. Uh, but ha to what degree, I don't know. I don't know. It's just a, it's a, it's just a reaction or not. I'm trying to figure out the right stock market. I, no, it's, I, I mean, I, we've been struggling with this. I mean, I'm, I, I love talking the, the open source commercial model pieces. If that's because I, I think that, uh, and y'all know my history with open stack. Um, and I feel like we, we got very enthusiastic about giving away software without thinking about what it, what it meant. Um, and I think that, you know, the idea, you know, people sort of come back around that the idea that you're just going to get free software, um, evaporated pretty fast. Right. And that's, there's still a lot of open source people who intentionally or whatever conflate open source and free. I mean, the F O S S does that all the time, but they, they claim they mean free differently than free than without payment. But in terms of what, what I'm looking at is that it's still a very viable. A very viable what? Lawrence, your mic. Community is still Lawrence, your mic, your mic is something, is something. Yeah, something feels like it's clicking, or that no, feels sounds like it's clicking. Here we go. Better? Feels like yes. a cat was sitting on uh, it. It's yeah. my stupid headphones. I'm sorry. Uh, OpenStack's still very much in use. Yeah. Um, and 
I don't know if that is that are people and is it being used by and assuming it's being used by telcos and uh, universities come people are making some money off of it is that the case um yes. red hat is i don't know of of other commercial distributions like SUSE shut theirs down canonical i suspect makes some money off of it mm -hmm. um o ovh ovh probably makes money off of it still um they have their they, own well ho but hosting it not selling yeah, it right right agree so that, that my point was so my so what I'm just thinking is that OpenStack and now Kubernetes are both successful open source communities with viable long-term that are successful, even if they're not commercially successful. Right. Um, exactly. And so in my mind, that's a good thing. Um, and are companies making money off of the derivatives of those ecosystems. And if so, that's a good thing. So you said the word that we were gonna go back to. This is this is where we were gonna pick up the thread from last week. So we're right. we're in exactly the right spot, which is ecosystems. Because in, in my in my opinion, one of the big failures for OpenStack, and I mean this is an ongoing thing, I'm sure they would disagree, um, but I don't think that they built an ecosystem that sustained the product. Matter of fact, they kept having vendors bouncing out of their ecosystem. And I, I think that was a problem. Kubernetes, I think, is doing a better job building an ecosystem. But I, I feel like, and we said this last week, the, the ecosystem is very fragmented and confusing. And one of the challenges that we talked, or we talked to, and always worth bringing back up, is, is, is an ecosystem where you're basically adding features into the product as an ecosystem. Or is the ecosystem when people assume this is what I would like to see because Amazon's an ecosystem. I can sell something that uses Amazon. Actually, hold on, I'm going to spin back and try and frame this, and then we'll we can bring yeah. back to open and source. Actually, yeah. as you do this, um, yeah. Quick question: When you talk about an ecosystem, what are the metrics you use, or the or the the qualifiers you use that would say this is a successful ecosystem, a non, a, not a successful ecosystem. Ecosystem by their, by their definition, go through changes. An ecosystem has things that are experiments that die <laughs> uh, and die out. That is what That's an true. ecosystem is. Um, uh -huh. they, they morph in and they adapt to, you know, a context or the context in which they operate. Yeah. And a successful ecosystem, at the very least, if you want to you know, set, the, set the bar wherever you'd like, but a successful ecosystem might be one that has stability or permanence. Uh, another definition ah. of ecosystem might be growth or um, uh, a successful ecosystem might be uh, one that overcomes and replaces something else. So let's be clear about at the outset here and what you mean by an ecosystem. I, I will I will give you the way I'm trying to think about it. Um, and I, I like your your question because it, it frames out my thinking much better. When when I'm looking for an ecosystem here, I am thinking of companies that use the environment created by the, the product we're talking about as a as basically a, a, a given a stable given marketplace where their product where their product or service can exist um, as, as sort of as an assumption so um, uh, cloud health tech is, might be a, a good example because they got happily acquired and they're doing their thing, but they basically existed as an Amazon price optimization platform, right? Hey, we're going to, you know, and that, that, and they exist, they could only exist because Amazon was a sufficiently large and stable ecosystem that they could build a product that they could sell. So now the weird thing about them that I actually think is, is a problem 
is they existed because Amazon was was missing something, which is billing transparency. Right. But right. but if if I'm gonna if I'm gonna sell somebody, VMware actually created a huge ecosystem where it's like, hey, I I need to make it easier to deliver my software to enterprises. I if if the enterprise has VMware, I can show up at that enterprise and sell my software without worrying about the infrastructure. VMware created a huge ecosystem for enterprise IT. Um, right. What what I don't see happening is somebody says, oh, if if I have open if I have a product that requires OpenStack as an underlay, I can go sell it to a hundred companies or actually more than a hundred, a hundred thousand companies because they all have the same underpinnings that I need to make my stuff work. And now I've got, you know, it's not, and okay, let me finish my sentence. So now I've got a place to go sell my software or my product or my good because something has, has created stability in the marketplace commoditized to something. So right. can I talk about OpenStack stuff that, that I saw was people sell, and this is Kubernetes too. It's like, oh, I'm going to sell you something that fixes Kubernetes for you. There, and that's not an ecosystem, right? It is, if I show up and say, oh, if you have Kubernetes, you know, 1.20 installed or above, then my product will work. I can sell you my product and I don't have to worry about, you know, the, any, you know, it, I, you've just reduced the friction to me. This is where the ecosystem comes in. You just reduce the friction for me to work, sell into my environment. And so let me add something to that, Rob. Yeah. Um, if, if you guys recall, I, I ran the VMware practice at Rackspace when they were pushing OpenStack back okay. in 2011 to 2015. Uh, the way I think of it is the ecosystem is like a mall. It's a shopping mall. And for any shopping mall to be successful, you've got to have some anchor tenants. And with OpenStack, we didn't have any anchor tenants. So what I mean by that is, hmm. it, it's so you, let's, let's compare it with Kubernetes. Kubernetes heavily backed by Google. Google is able to not only contribute to the code base, but they're also able to contribute from a channel and a partner perspective and a customer perspective. So you, so for the ecosystem to work, much like a shopping mall, you've got to have the anchor tenant to bring the customers into the mall, and then they're going to go shop at you know Starbucks. But and, you know, but, but I, let me clarify something because what you're describing to me is more like the mall, the person who runs the mall. So the Simon, if you will, if you, I don't know how much you know you mm. the mall real estate markets, but um, so somebody who is ma who is building malls, they spec them, they do the invite right. The anchor tenant to me, and I don't know that Kubernetes has an anchor tenant. An anchor tenant would be you know with SAP financials or Oracle databases or um, you know maybe you know if Snowflake was if Snowflake said hey we run on any Kubernetes out there and and you know. 80, everybody's using Snowflake, um, Rook, IO, which well, is that, well, you're, the storage you're company right. maybe is closer, um, but. With, with Kubernetes, uh, so Google GCP had native support for Kubernetes very early on. Mm -hmm. And I think that that was one of the things that drove their, their win against Docker. Now with OpenStack, right? So we, we had a managed OpenStack offering at Rackspace. Right. But Rackspace at the time was only a $1.2 billion company. And that offering, I don't think ever exceeded a hundred million in annual revenue. Um, so if we're the Simon property group of the mall, right, we're providing floor space for the retail being the, the quote anchor tenant or the Google or whatever, we've got to have the ability to bring, attract the other the other folks, because it's it's that critical mass that you've got to get to before the ecosystem really takes off. And it's not just contribute con contributions to the code base. It's also bringing in customers and bringing in implementation uh, uh, skill sets from SIs, for example. So like, um, um, you know, Rackspace, we were never able to attract like the Accentures and Deloitte's to be able to build the implementation services around or you know OpenStack, you had a couple of big companies that adopted it like Walmart, 
but that that didn't really scale because you hadn't built a factory where it could be easy to consume by a lar- by large numbers of, of large organizations, which you need large or- organizations because that's the kind of scale that requires adoption of something like an open stack. But even even so, I, there was never a lamp stack for OpenStack. I'm thinking, John. You know, this is one of uh, John, not not this John's. Uh, but yeah, never it never right. really got filled out, did it? Well, and that's so. At at one point, briefly, there looked like a time when it would be Kubernetes, right? Kubernetes would be the killer app for OpenStack, um, and you know, but that. That never that didn't trans that didn't transpire because OpenStack itself wasn't didn't have the broad the broad attraction um, and it well, was, it was too it to, was too complicated to build and maintain frankly there's it, too much complexity in that stack the the interesting thing to me is there's another overlooked thing with Kubernetes um, that people really miss Kubernetes had hardwired the DNS integrations to the cloud into Kubernetes. And Kubernetes without a DNS server does not work, or a load balancer. And the, the, the this is this drives me nuts because the the thing that Kubernetes didn't have and didn't need and took a long time to build in um, was a load balancer. Uh, the thing that made Cloud Foundry work was it built they built the load balancer into it because they were an enterprise platform, not a cloud platform. And Kubernetes, a lot of the adoption on Kubernetes was based on an installer that somebody wrote that only worked in Amazon called uh, COPS, still still very popular. And okay. a lot of the Kubernetes stuff worked because people, there was you know one installer that worked in one cloud, it wasn't Google's. Um, Thank you. Robert, when you're talking about that, yeah. that, right? I mean, when you talk about Cloud Foundries being successful, Pivotal had less than 400, com- 400 customers, right? Contrast that to the number of Kubernetes deployments throughout the day. It, it's a complete <laughs> failure compared to Kubernetes. So if you, if you look at, if you look at statistical numbers and put them behind these statements, I just can't agree with that. I mean, Kubernetes is a massive success compared to Cloud Foundry. Kubernetes is a huge success, and and I I, I should be careful on just you know a, Kubernetes is is a runaway hit. I, you are completely right. Nothing else is even close, right? Um, that doesn't mean that it is. I don't think it has the killer app in it yet. And I think that if we can, if somebody figures out a killer app, then it's, that would make Kubernetes easier to displace. But if, if, what's the killer app on Linux? I think you're conflating things, right? Oh, that's a good question. Uh, the lamp yeah, stack. Yeah, I was going to say, what's the killer app on AWS? I mean, it all works and stuff, but what's the killer app on AWS? <laughs> well, I mean, I, I, mean, I like that. these. I like I like these questions a lot. What you're describing—it's funny because I was just talking about this in my last meeting. What you're describing are sandboxes, and the sandbox is the app. Yeah, I mean, I I, I might be following. I don't know if Rich was going to say something uh, there, but um, and and maybe the same thing. But uh, I see Amazon's killer app as um, as two and the S three the barrier to entry. Exactly. Rich, What's killer about Am- what's killer about Amazon? Well, there are a couple of things, and and what I guess I'm still having trouble discerning the difference between, or what I think I know what the difference is between an ecosystem and a market and mm-hmm. a functioning market, which I I don't think are necessarily the same thing. In Amazon's case, they have a they have supplied an infrastructure that permits wide variation, lots of variety, and they continue to add themselves um, major kind of piece parts that the developer community in particular wants, and they listen very carefully to that constituency. So is there a killer app? No, what's killer about Amazon is the infrastructure, is the underpinnings and the flexibility there. Yeah, they're, they're, Amazon's and platform is use. a catalyst for the ecosystem that exists on it. It's Around like it. a substrate, right? right? 
So everything from the SaaS companies that build financial payment systems on top of it to the engineers that get certifications on AWS that go to other places, all of that, all of those, all of those uh, organisms, if you will, live in on top of the substrate. Exactly. And that's where I was, that's the point I was trying to make about Kubernetes was there was enough of a substrate with Google already <laughs> where it, where it would start to grow. And I think that was the difference between Docker and Kubernetes was the Google piece. Yeah, just, just I'm looking at something that Mark wrote and this is related to what you guys were saying is that if I were a startup, I wouldn't want to become a, become, rely on being part of the AWS ecosystem as my sole business model is I'm reliant on AWS's plans solely. That's the biggest problem with, with AWS is that you're still relying on them as the sole source of your, your business. They change your, your business, you, you lose your business. It's as simple as that. The, but the problem is, is that there's no alternative. They have, so how, what do you do? The reason why these open source projects are so appealing is that it's the long term of the, it's that vague, vague appeal of, of no vendor lock-in. I just don't, is that still the case? Yeah, yeah so so I would I would just maybe add a little bit to what Larry was just saying. And, and you know, if I think back to I don't because I, I don't know what the right answer is. So I'm sort of throwing this out to the crowd. When I think back to the early days of the VMware um, ecosystem, and I was very involved not in making it happen, but in watching it happen because I was an early adopter. So every new opportunity at the edge of what was a nascent vSphere at the time um, was interesting to me because it was really hard to use VMware in the first few years, uh, you know, 2002, 2003. Um, and back then the dynamic of VMware and the market changed fairly slowly. So was that the reason that the ecosystem seemed more gentle? Is VMware truly a nicer father to the ecosystem participants. Um, and therefore it just looks like Amazon is meaner because they change at a faster pace and they really just don't give a shit about the people that are tagging along. Um, uh, I don't know, right? I, I'm, I'm asking that of the audience really because I, I, don't, I don't know. Well, the, I th the, I think better comp the better competitor translates to meaner because there's more losers. I, Maybe, I think, yeah. I think we need to separate out enterprise adoption from startups here because it's a different dynamic. Uh, for startups, we've got, let's see, Rob, Mark, myself, who else, who else is a uh, co-founder of a startup right now on this call? Yeah. At least three of four, mm -hmm. four of us. Um, for a startup, this, not we're not typical mm -hmm. startups, by the way. I, I, I know most of you guys and we are not typical startup entrepreneurs. The typical startup entrepreneur is somebody that gets into an incubator like Y Combinator. And the first thing they want to do is establish product market fit, which is to expend the least amount of time and least amount of capital to achieve product market fit, show growth and, you know, ARR and use that to get to the next round of funding, knowing that they're going to completely rebuild the back end of the platform. So what I submit is that in most of the most of the startup ecosystem, they don't care about open source or vendor lock-in. If it will help them get to an MVP that will get them product market fit and the next round of funding faster, it's great. But that's all they care about. I agree. I, I, I've never you know, been a founder, uh, but I've been at both Y Combinator and other types of startups. And the Y Combinator model is exactly what, what you said. Most, most startups that are working as, uh, to create software apps have exactly that matter, model. How do you do, get to where you can sell it 
in the cheapest, fastest way possible? Uh, well, that's what the, I mean, the VCs, I mean, so one of the problems with venture capitalists is they become increasingly non-technical. Right. And, and so if everything they do is like going on an episode of Shark Tank, <laughs> you know, what's your break even? I mean, to the point of, you know, they ask stupid questions. Um, but I still think, and, and forgetting that for a moment, it really depends upon what you're building. Right. And, and so if you're building frameworks, if you're building core technology like databases and that stuff, they still care whether it's an open source project or not. Right. If I'm building, um, TikTok, you know, I'm building some consumer facing application. Yeah, no one cares because there's no there's no strategy around uh, open source in that market. Yeah, I, I agree with you, John. Exactly. I, I would I, I would take it back to the ecosystem conversation, which is the snowflakes of the world are not driving the bulk of the startup utilization of cloud services like AWS. It's the Y Combinators of the world. And that's, that's what's really building the bulk of the growth of it. Um, to your point, like with, with Snowflake and with what I'm doing and with you know, what, what the other folks on this call are doing, we're in the minority, right? We're more like Snowflake than we are like Y Combinator. But for ecosystem growth, it's really more about you know, the 197 startups in the ATDC that we're a part of, uh, and maybe five of them are in the category that we're in. Well, this is, you know, this is the baby turtles making it off the beach and, and into the sea and how many, how many make it through. No, yeah. And that is what an ecosystem is about. I mean, there is, there is a, you know, there's wide variation. There are lots of attempts. There are very few that actually make it, uh, that survive for very long. And there are, you know, there are kind of plateaus. So there is a lot of turnover and the, and quite frankly, the ecosystem continues to thrive because there's a lot of turnover because they're, they're basically consuming and quite frankly, destroying some of these, these companies. Um, they spend a lot of, in, in total, they will spend a lot of money. They will attract a lot of attention. They attract a lot of investment in, the, in, the, in total. What the return on that investment is in, as, a, as an ecosystem, that would be an interesting, that would be an interesting factor to, to throw in here. If I took all of the venture capital that was put into, uh, let's call it consumer side software or software you know, built on cloud, what would be the return, the, the, the total return on investment of that invested capital? I, I suspect that the, the big cloud players know that I don't know how familiar you guys are with the the new Microsoft startup programs with Azure. Um, they're, they are very deliberate in the way they're structuring their startup programs. They bring you in, they'll give you, you know, $25,000 in free cloud credits and um, system engineer support for building out your SaaS app on Microsoft and then access into the partner ecosystem. But then the, the way that they monetize their startup program is very much geared towards getting you to put additional capabilities or additional apps into their marketplace, as well as if, if you're on the service provider side to get you uh, signing up additional recurring revenue customers into your service provider practice. So it's extremely well designed from their perspective, but they definitely understand the value of these startups in, in the ecosystem perspective. And, and they're not the ones that are paying that much to, you know, of the total, of the total set of resources going to the creation of these companies. Microsoft's contribution to them is piddling by uh, comparison to what the venture folks are putting in, what the founders are putting in, in terms of their own, sweat and sweat equity, 
amount of time. This is, you know, this is a form of colonialism, if you want to think of it that way. Yeah, and, it's, a, it's uh, a great force multiplier for them. I mean, sure. they're, they're getting, you know, this is a 10 this cents is, on, on the dollar, you know, they're getting a dollar return on 10 cents investment. Yeah, exactly. And, and, you know, for them, you know, early stage companies are a renewable resource. They can just, you know, they're just, it's, it's <laughs> an, un, let's, I won't say it's renewable, but it's certainly uh, there seems to be no end in sight for its, for the generation. They don't, Interesting. they don't have a net, they don't have a net, uh, consumption that reduces the uh, total supply or the future supply. And they've been doing this since uh, the dot-com days. Uh, sure. They, yeah. they give, you know, free database or free uh, infrastructure, whatnot. And that forces these startups to build their infrastructure on top of Microsoft products, if you will, and that gets some lock-in. It was really irritating to be at a startup that did that. <laughs> that is the one of the least effective ways to to operate. So that's one of those mistakes that startups make is and, accepting yeah. donations because you're trying to save us a little bit of money. Making mm -hmm. those ex making technology decisions based off of who's giving you who, who will give you the, who give you the largest number of credits yeah yeah and but you can you can game the system i certainly do uh, <laughs> i did some 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 tests dev on azure cloud because i had twenty five thousand in free credits uh, but i've got one script that lets me deploy my platform over to aws so i'm i'm the exception rather than the rule in that respect mm -hmm. i also think cash flow is important don't get me wrong <laughs> Yeah, I don't think I'd look at when you think about Microsoft versus um, AWS versus GCP, right? If you're making a decision to get into the Microsoft um, camp, right, you're going to get on the user side. You're not doing it because of credits. You're doing it because you want access to their enterprise customers and they're the best channel to get there, right? And, and that's, by the way, there's been just a probably more successful companies that have hitched their boat to Microsoft than those that have tried to play neutral. Yeah, and there's, and the, it, there's the customer angle as well. The reason I started doing the, my Azure work was because I had a commercial bank, mortgage bank that was concerned about Amazon getting into the mortgage banking business and they didn't want to do it on AWS. Yeah. And, and that's what I was going to say about AWS, right? As a startup, my problem is if I'm successful, um, AWS will probably come and just take that and, and you know, hopefully buy it, if not just replicate it. They have no problem with eating their young. Yeah. And, yeah. and going back to an earlier conversation, the, the success of OpenStack in, a, in enterprise and the biggest, as far as I know, the biggest OpenStack, commercial OpenStack user is Walmart. Well, Walmart on the cloud does not use Amazon because Amazon is the enemy. Anima Amazon is their competitor. So here you have an ecosystem. They are in a, they're in a battle. There, there are ecosystems that are, that are fighting, fighting for kind of supremacy, if not supremacy, at least, um, resilience and, and persistence. And in the case of OpenStack and, and Red Hat right now. Well, so, as, of, as of 2015, last I heard back when I was still a racker, they were spending something like $600 million a year in their OpenStack clusters on premise. More, it's a lot more now. But are they, but, are they, still, are they still using it? Oh yeah. I haven't, I haven't heard boo about it, so. <clears throat> oh, absolutely. Okay. Walmart, you bet they uh, are. Like an, I see like twenty eight street to the twenty eighteen. Yeah. Who? Who do you think? Outlier, who, though, they're so big. Yeah, but no. well, and they've got you know who knows how many data centers, but yeah, they are they are one of the they are now one of IBM's largest uh, largest customers by virtue of of their spend on 
on open Red Hat OpenStack. On, on Red Hat OpenStack. And Tencent too. Yeah. There's, there's, there, are, there are plenty of OpenStack customers, especially long-term stable now, um, no doubt. I mean, I think, look, with OpenStack, I mean, I, I haven't been an OpenStack user. Um, I, I think it never reached enterprise quality. Right. Right. I think that's why you didn't get an ecosystem around it. I mean, little things like being never upgrade from one release to the next, uh, that's kind of important. Yeah, and I, it never reached that because you had too many little players that were heavily opinionated and frankly arrogant about their vision and how they wanted OpenStack to go. Whereas where you have an ecosystem like Kubernetes, you've got your anchor tenants that are really kind of driving the direction of the platform that's fairly controversial. I'd love to hear what you guys think. No, I, I agree with that. And if you take a look at OpenStack, the, the drivers became, uh, currently, a lot of the drivers now are the operators of those clouds, as, as it should have been from the beginning. The folks who are using it uh, especially if it's going to be a, a cloud or a multi-tenant cloud, you would think that uh, it's larger customers, you would get an anchor tenant. But uh, the, the drivers in OpenStack, uh, a lot of the players were undisciplined. You didn't have people coming out of commercial companies that were driving it for the customer. They were driving it for their own uh satisfaction almost and so yeah never hit enterprise because a lot of the folks who were building it never experienced enterprise in their life <laughs> well but i think if you, if you think that the the operators are the right people to drive that i don't agree with that at all right i mean that's that's like the dying leading the dead you well know? you need the the greenfield operators some of those operators need to be in there, there needs to be something to balance the operators. Every good company has a tension across it, but they totally ignored their end users for five years. There's, but there's a, to me, there's a very fundamental thing, even beyond Rocky, what you're talking about is in OpenStack, the community wanted it to be all open source. And if you showed up to monetize it, you were not welcomed in that community. And in Kubernetes, the core contributors, what we've been calling the anchor tenants here, want to monetize the, the crap out of the platform. They just don't need to monetize the software. And so there's a weird balance here where they get to say, oh, it's Kubernetes, it's open source. They don't, they don't, you know, they charge money for Kubernetes. And, and they, they've always charged money for Kubernetes. Um, and, and so Kubernetes is a, has a commercial, has a, oh yeah, we commercialized this component to it that was never a comfortable suit worn by the OpenStack people. So in I my opinion, it's, it's just, yeah. you start from this, oh, you're commercial, go off to the corner, we'll begrudgingly accept you. And in Kubernetes, they're still struggling with this because I, I watch open source communities and the CNCF and things like that, they're like, oh, it's open source stuff. If you take your commercial product and open source, it will give it lots of love. Um, they're still a little bifurcated here, but by, by and large, it's like, oh yeah, these are all commercial products. No, so, there's never a problem. So Rackspace. Well, it, it, it was also a different time, right? You know, I think yeah. part of the allure of Kubernetes is that a lot of people see that as an alternative to AWS market power. That kind of like if we all band together, they don't completely dominate. Whereas in the age of the early age of OpenStack, it wasn't quite the same dynamic at that point yet. Um, in what sense wasn't it, Tyler? I mean, it was. It was uh, OpenStack was was basically. A lot of the a lot of the noise that was generated around OpenStack was you do not have to be a um, a slave or a, a a dependent upon 
the Amazon the the Amazon platform. The Amazon yeah, you, you, the VMware. You're right. I agree with that. Or Richard. VMware if you were or, or VMware if you were in enterprise. Right. I, I guess back in 2014, 15, it was more AWS cloud versus a managed co-location or on-premise or a managed service kind of model. So right. kind of the pr managed private cloud versus public cloud, mm -hmm. whereas that that fight has been determined at this point. Oh, yeah. So, but it's also uh, the, the p OpenStack, like Rob, Rob was saying, had this purity test. <laughs> and if you weren't pure enough, you didn't count. So when when Oracle wanted to <laughs> run yeah. with Solaris, Solaris wasn't pure enough, mainly because it was backed by Oracle. Uh, a lot of the original uh, review stuff was to make sure that Red Hat couldn't dominate or that Rackspace couldn't dominate. And so it it really was kind of a community anarchist group versus <laughs> folks who wanted to, to make money and not be not have their stuff stolen by Amazon. Oh, you you are so right, Rocky. I you know I had a first uh, row seat to that joining Rackspace in 2011, and folks like you know Mark Collier and Jim Curry and these other guys they really had a chip on their shoulders with respect to the big enterprise players because they came up in Rackspace, you know, in 2011, Rackspace was a $700 million company and they're, you know, they're jealous of AWS's success and they're jealous of Oracle and they're jealous of all these guys. And oh, by the way, three years before Rackspace had gone IPO and there was this whole crop of guys like me that came from places like IBM and HP and Oracle and, and Dell into the Rackspace culture. So there was also this kind of mirroring sort of uh, jealousy that the old time Rackers had to the new corporate enterprise types that almost reflected itself in the open spec strategy. It was really a kind of crazy environment to be part of. Yeah, anarchy is not a good basis for an ecosystem. That's right. Well, also, when you have something like uh, anarchy as the uh, driving force, you have, it's the youngsters. It's the people where all this stuff is religion. And a lot of these youngsters had no experience in real enterprise companies or any companies other than startups. And it's, their attitude was my way or the highway rather than oh, if we change it this way, it makes it easier for our customers as they scale. I don't know. <laughs> so if you go back to the concept of ecosystem, right? I mean, the definition that's kind of being put in here is one that creates a, a large enough viable economic system for others to participate. And what you're describing in OpenStack is basically making sure you excluded any of those people. They excluded so many of them that there was no means of self sustaining. There, there was no self. There was no. There was no ecosystem. There was no cycle that was self sustained. Yeah, it's kind of like there's too much uh, acid in the soil. So instead of being able to grow a vegetable garden or a forest, all you could grow is roses. So I think to, to Tim's point, I guess if you're going to talk about ecosystems, I think the question here is you know, where, what ecosystems do we think evolve that are meaningful over the next five and 10 years? Yeah, I get, I guess the, what I was having trouble with is I feel like we're rehashing the conversation or the conversation yeah, okay. is rehashing <laughs> what, what happened with OpenStack again. And I agree. I mean, I'll be candid. It's not that for me, it's not that interesting. What's more interesting would be, okay, so is there something we have learned from that and all of those rehashes that could apply to what's what's going to happen in the next 10 years, nine plus years? Um, and so that seems to be a more productive use. I mean, there's there's quite a group of folks here with quite a bit of experience. And that seems like, the, well, and, seems and like a better use I, of our time. I, I think the other right. is a good example. I, I think you're right. I think OpenStack is the wrong ecosystem to study 
I would submit that the, the ecosystem we should be talking about, which we haven't mentioned, is actually the Node.js ecosystem. Oh, so huh. maybe I, you know, I, I'll, well, I'll listen to that one second. I was going to say that what, was in, what I've been looking at is the data ecosystem. So like I was mm. chatting away with the, someone who was managing a, a project called Open Lineage, which is basically trying to connect all the uh, like the data hub, Marquez, all these connectors to data sources with all the data warehouses. And he, he basically has created one data state, what might be the data standard that's connect, gonna connect all these uh, new mm -hmm. projects together. He might be the linchpin between everything, but who's gonna be managing this project? Who's, how's that gonna be governed? So for me, that might be the head hub of the, of the whole new ecosystem. Uh, he might be the, wow. the, 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 the success, linchpin for the success or failure for a whole entire new economy. So I'm trying to figure out which new ecosystem should we support and which ones should the VC support and be able to take a haircut in terms of profit so they could nurture a larger ecosystem, make the whole entire economy grow and let oh, hundreds of other uh, businesses grow instead of trying to let, in this case, let's say a company called like Fivetran make a lot of money. Well, I, I don't, I think we're gonna be waiting a long time if we're gonna wait for a VC to take a haircut for that. Um, maybe, <laughs> but uh, there's, I mean, I get it, but that's what I'm, I, the, when, the, chal the challenge is we need to a VC backed yeah. entity that successfully started a ecosystem. But wait, but, but hold, hold on a second. It doesn't exist. I don't I, think. I, I, let me, and we're almost out of time, but t I want to go back to something Tim said and Tyler, what you're talking about, but there's a, there's a, there's an interesting open stack legacy to me that we are talking around that we need to cover. And Lawrence, Lawrence brought it up really well. We now have this assumption that you have to have an open source project in the middle of some type of an exchange instead of it being APIs and standards. And, and the, the thing that I think is missing from a going forward conversation, and, and I want to know how we get this back, is it, it, sh it shouldn't be necessary to have an open source project like Kubernetes that makes it possible to run applications in a standard way. It, the container was the standard and some management interface might be the standard, but the idea that it has to be the source code of Kubernetes, just like it had to be the source code of OpenStack. And I was in the middle of this with OpenStack. That to me is actually a problem. The, the APIs and the interface exchanges are, are where we should be open. Not that we have to have a, a platform or utility that, that does that. I mean, Linux, I, yeah, I'm trying that, to get this Rob, to gel, I mean, but but I, I feel like we're we're trying to find we're saying oh it has to be this open source thing that's a community good. I think you product. nailed it, Rob, and that's what I was talking about with Node.js. It happens to be open source, but what is more important is that JavaScript is the standard that most companies use to build their web APIs. Yeah. So the JSON format or XML are the standards of interchange of data between systems. And that is all supported by Node.js, which is why when I started using Node.js three, four years ago, they had a quarter of a million packages. And now Node Package Manager has like a million and a half. I, I, yeah, I, agree. It. I can agree with Tim again. I think, I think. <laughs> We're in the weeds. We keep going back in open source. We keep going back in open stack. I, th I think the question should be more around what ecosystem is beginning to develop. Is it edge? Is it data? Right? I, I think there's some much broader categories of things where ecosystems will be formed around. And, and we keep getting pulled down into the tool. Well, I like to, I, I think Rob, though, has a valid point with the APIs. And hi, Lawrence. <laughs> Just a second. Uh, the, the issue along those lines is that the software world wants to solve things with software projects. 
And before the software world existed, there was the world of standards in the technology world that was both software and hardware. But the software world doesn't care, doesn't want to deal with standards. They want projects because standards don't generate lines of code. So there's no way to measure their their machoism by lines of code if it's all just standards. I I mean that's being standards, cynical, standards. but well, that's that's why I keep going back to Node.js because of the ECMA standard process is very standards driven. But but it, it just seems like I mean I mean we, we talk about I mean are you talking JavaScript or are we talking TypeScript? Which which level of conformance are you going between those things? I mean, oh well, there's there's uh, there's all kinds of permutations. I'm not actually talking about the technology. I'm talking about the fact that you've got tens of thousands of software vendors out there that are heavily incented to make their stuff interoperate on the web. And the best way to do that is by creating connectors using JavaScript that other companies can use to hook into their stuff. W3CI. I, I don't know. I mean, to me, the, the, the conversation around standards is that standards have never kept pace with technology. They're always a partial solution. Mm -hmm. TCP IP? No, it's, that's been the yeah. dilemma. TCP IP is still changing. Yeah, and it's still standard. It, well, which one? Are you talking, you know, are you talking about BBR? Or which congestion control algorithm? What about ECN? Uh, well, it, was, it, there was even, you? like, you, you remember a couple of years ago, everybody was all gaga about Swagger? Oh, and, yeah. Right? Oh. And as a way to standardize, go back to WSDL from a, you know, SOAP perspective, it was the, supposed to be the WSDL for REST. I'm talking so acronyms, there's, but... There's two, there's two approaches. One is you should have standards, a standards approach that is going, people developing standards. And then you have reference implementations of standards and specifications. And then you go back and you see which work, what works and what doesn't and whatever is then what's actually being used in the real life world. Maybe that turns into what's actually becomes the standard going forward. You don't rely on what necessarily the standards body created, created as the standard. That's what you're just saying, the guidelines, until something better comes along. So, let's it, talk about something. You have to have some sort of way to organize people's thought processes. And also because piece of governance issues in terms of uh, for the change management people, the the enterprise level of, of IT support, you basically you need standards for some lot cert for other things. So I got to run, folks. Yeah, we're, so we're, we're over. Cool this is, I, I know Tim's frustrated because we get down in the weeds, but I, I actually feel like we circle around to these bigger issues. We have to figure out how to it's influence it. No, I think to, Sorry, we started down AI before, right? Think about things that are not going to be standard, right? Operationalizing and automating um, operations with AI and ML, that's not going to be a standard, but it is probably future. Uh, I want to come back to that. Because <laughs> <laughs> I, I think this, this is tied into the complexity question and ecosystems are where we get repeated pat you know and I, I feel like i did a crap job defining ecosystems here in useful ways rich your questions were really much better than my answers well, i was gonna say um, your homework for next week or some week in the future yeah yeah i think i think we have to make a clear distinction between ecosystems and markets mm -hmm. and I, that and it's not that they're they're separate from one another but in point of fact ecosystems have, you know, or let's put it this way, successful ecosystems have to be, we have to put some criteria on them and what that means. Uh, I, I think that uh, John's huh. point about huh. AI and operationalizing, well, I would say operationalizing AI and other aspects of data, especially as you move more and more towards data as code 
is going to be a, a big issue. I think going back to APIs, um, I'm, I'm not sure I would characterize Swagger and what has happened with APIs as the way you have, uh, Rob, but um, okay. I would say that there's a point where the ecosystem has evolved so that we now have, you know, gRPC and we've got a lot more, uh, we've got a, uh, We've got parts of the ecosystem where REST, you know, kind of classic REST still still works. It's fine. It's it's useful in some situations, but it's not the all singing, all dancing approach to exposed surfaces. So, so go ahead. Yeah, go well, ahead, Rob. What Rich said, what you said about data and what John said about AI takes us back to what Lauren said about uh, essentially a standards through open source of data formats, data communications, how to communicate data across multiple platforms and multiple sources is going to be critical to getting the AI working that we need to operationalize uh, the this, this scalability. So... Yeah. <laughs> And now the big question is, how, are you going to use YAML files to standardize ah! the data as infrastructure? Yeah, no, this is, this no. is actually, <laughs> I, I think, I think this is, it's the interfaces between these things I mean, that I, we're I getting to. Let me try to go. Bye. Yeah. yeah. John, can you hold it? Together. Thanks. Yeah, I can. I just. All right. I'll, I'll, Make I'll, note I'll, so you can, you can pick it up first thing next week. Yeah. All, right. <laughs> All right, everybody. Have a good weekend. Wow, what a good conversation. Um, we cover a lot of ground here. Um, and in the back channel, Tim Crawford's asking, uh, what's the point? Where are we going? And I, I think we we came back to that at the very end. Uh, and that, as always, triggers more conversations where we need to talk about this. We're still waiting to have a conversation about the cost of complexity. Uh, that's always in the back of my mind. And um, I think we're going to get there next week. So tune in at the2030.cloud. See you there.